Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our final session in our Small Business Survival Toolkit. By way of introduction, if you haven't seen me over the last nine weeks, my name is Manaj Chiba, and I'm a full-time faculty member here at the Gordon Institute of Business Science. Thanks to the Entrepreneurship Development Academy and JP Morgan, we've been able to put together nine pieces or nine ingredients to really get us going to understand from a small business perspective, specifically around how do we create a survival toolkit. So welcome. I would like to welcome our esteemed panel as well, who I'll give you a brief introduction to shortly. But I thought where we'd start is really just recap sort of the, the last nine weeks that we've been together. And if I start off, and I'm gonna start off from week nine and work our way backward, uh, which I think just makes more sense from my perspective. For those that joined us last week, we were with Stephen Zwane and Mars Zwane from Busy Corner. Some of the critical takeouts from that operations piece was really about starting internally. Mazwani was really looking at her internal employees as well. But the thing that really stood out for me was about reimagining, rethinking, and remodeling. Prior to Stephen, we started off in part eight with Lauren Mustad. And I thought that was really important because it took an HR angle to it, or more an IRR or ERR perspective on it as well. The key points that came out for employees specifically, number one, safety first. Understand what business as usual is, number two. Number three, it's about survival. And I think we've got a great panel to talk about that. And number four, the business of the future to a large extent as well. So really about balancing the employee and the business needs as well. In part seven, we had a session on marketing with Avi specifically. Be cognizant of how the consumer is feeling. I think it's about empathizing. Also understand that we've got new data coming through. New thinking, is the radio still a, a channel to market on? Number three, never stop marketing, um, which I thought was really important for us to understand, is that even in these difficult times, is marketing still needs to be done. And then he left us with a very powerful thought, uh, quote by Nelson Mandela, who said, I never lose, I only win and learn, which I think is really critical for us here today. Part six, it was me who spoke about innovation and design thinking, really around pivoting your business, using of existing resources being really important, not new ones, existing ones that are recombined quite differently. But that also requires us to think differently at the same time. Part five was really about leadership in a crisis with uh, Professor Corin Skippers. And what she really touched on was about mapping. And I like the analogy of mapping, just mapping seasons, capabilities, and process. And if you think of what we saw there, specifically on our opening slide was around autumn. Is this just another passing season? How long is it? So what is happening is just temporary, which was the key takeaway there. But more importantly, from a leadership perspective, leading your organizations, it's really about empathy. And how do we support each other? So where we have a panel today, how do we support each other in creating an ecosystem to really create that real backbone that helps small businesses? Part four, we really spoke about the macroeconomic strategy with Professor Adrian Saville as well, which was really about harnessing the benefits of the current crisis to really rethink for us as small businesses, how do we reinvent our ways? Number two, he spoke around business turnaround and examples of pivoting specifically that he gave us. And also we in the fog of war as, he, as, as the analogy that he used, it's the strength of the team that matters as, as Adrian Saville had told us there. Part three, going back, was really about resilience, specifically in decision-making. And the one part that really resonated with me there was about solving real needs or the root cause of problems. Let's solve those. Resilience is the ability to bend without breaking, which I think is really important and really critical in this as well. And then also with resilience is that we learn new skills. And those new skills are really critical. And that's what uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Doctor had told us about it. And what we saw is small businesses will have to bounce back and will find new opportunities to pursue. How many different ways to think about a problem was when she asked us specifically to say 13 divided by two. What is that answer? We specifically, we thought six and a half is a quick answer to that. But what was it? And that was by Dr. Charlene Liu. Part two was really around understanding consumer behavior, an aspect that I'm deeply passionate about as well. Because life as we know it has changed, especially for consumers. What do our consumers, you and I specifically, expect now 
from businesses. And how do we, as businesses with a different hat, start really leveraging that? We've got to start taking a holistic view. And what we see about that, again, is the partnership ecosystem. And this ecosystem helps us each support each other. And that's important. And imagine, which was really important for me, imagine this scenario 18 or 20 years ago, and all I remember there is the Nokia phone. What would we have been done? What would have done? What would, would we have done? We wouldn't be able to easily have these sort of sessions either. So I think there's an appreciation that we need to take also for the time and what we have at our disposal for small businesses. And the first session, ladies and gentlemen, which is one of my favorite sessions specifically, was really around finance. Because I think the core of any small business or any business in general is around really finding the finance. So I had a word with Dr. Keith Fairhurst. And the words that he used to me were, Manaj, it's really about rebooting the business, number one. Number two, care about your people. Care about your employees. And I think he says that there is ways out of this. We've just got to reimagine and rethink them. But the critical part about finance is how do you lengthen that runway of finance that you have, okay? What are those underutilized assets that you could convert to cash as an example and reduce debt? And that's really about what was really important there. But he also warned us, we can only deal with what we have in front of us right now, even though we've got to start thinking long-term as well. So I thought I'd just start with that recap, just to provide us where we've come from nine weeks ago to end us where we are today in our final session here with, uh, through the partnership with the EDA and JP Morgan. So it gives me great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to really introduce to you what I call a very important and a critical cog is the entrepreneurs out there people that have pivoted specifically. In no order of importance, I'm gonna start with Sonto. Sonto is the founder of Native Child. A Native Child is a hair and body care brand that uses only natural products. They gained numerous consumers online, specifically during this COVID time now, across the continent. Sonto, it was really interesting to, to hear that you can't keep up with demand. You know, yeah. this, is, this is what I want to hear, you know was one day last week and you now telling me we can't keep up with demand, how? Let's get together, let's understand this. And I'm hoping you'll share some of those, those thoughts with us. Um, but I must tell you, Sonto has also been widely featured by the likes of the BBC and various other media as well. So Sonto, welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, thank you. The other you. individual on a, no problem. We've got Ryan Bacher as well, uh, Ryan to a large extent, Many of us would have engaged uh, or, or at least consumed one or two of his products. Uh, Ryan is the co-founder of NetFlorist and Group Managing Director at the moment. He's also the co-founder of the South African e-retailers forum. So really welcome, uh, Ryan, and thank you for spending uh, this afternoon with us as well. Pleasure. After that, we've, we've also got Trizile Tlamini. Trizile, welcome. Trizile, ladies and gentlemen, is the owner of Green Scooter, which I find fascinating, which is a ride-sharing platform that uses electric vehicles the first of its kind in Africa, for Africa, by Africans. Absolutely amazing. Welcome, Fizile. Then we've got Amrish Narendas as well. Amrish is currently the head of an understudy equities at Futures Growth. Uh, Futures Growth's latest investment was in Sweep South. Um, and it always reminds me when we talk about Sweep South, that two of my colleagues at Gibbs had won a case study competition right here about Sweep South. And that's really going to go global as well now. And they're really around early stage investments. Um, one of the investment companies or the companies that uh, Future Growth had invested in upfront as well was Yoko, which, which, which really we, many of us would know. So Amrish, welcome and thank you for spending this afternoon with us. Thank you. Last but not least, ladies and gentlemen, is Miranda Hosking. Miranda is the director of the Entrepreneurship Development Academy here at Gibbs. Over and above this, she's also experienced in sort of professional with de demonstrated history of working with both public and private sector organizations with skills in business planning, operations management, strategy, economic development, and entrepreneurship. And I want to say, Miranda, this has probably been at least a major part, your brainchild, to put this toolbox together for us. And so I really thank you, and I think many businesses out there specifically well, thank you as well. So welcome Miranda as well as part of the panel. So I just want to remind the viewers here, whoever's joined us in streaming, if you've got any questions, please place them in the chat. Um, and I will, uh, if you've got them for a specific member of the panel, I'll, I'll raise it with them. 
But I really want to start here with Miranda, if you don't mind. You know, Miranda, if you could please just tell us a bit more about the JP Morgan and EDA partnership specifically for this series titled The Small Business Survival Toolkit that we've put together and what it means for small businesses. Thank you so much, Manoj, and thank you for having me today. I am very happy to be surrounded by so many leading entrepreneurs who have taught many of us many a lesson on how to pivot during a crisis and not just survive, but to thrive beyond it. And I think that was really the inspiration for the series. Um, mm. You know, when we started talking about it, we were looking at what could we as the EDA do as a stakeholder, as a role player in the entrepreneurship ecosystem to contribute um, something, you know, during this rough time of crisis and change for many entrepreneurs. Um, often I think we get caught in the narrative of how devastating this is going to be and is already for the economy and for many small businesses. And so what we wanted to do, and it really has been a team effort on our part, um, and so I wouldn't want to take the credit. Um, I would like for us to acknowledge the fact that my team has worked really hard in the background on putting this together. Um, and it wouldn't have been possible without the generous support of JP Morgan. So when we started talking to JP Morgan about this right at the beginning, it really was around the fact that they, as a bank, wanted to invest in some kind of emergency relief for small businesses, and particularly for small businesses in developing economies like ours, who would face, you know, um, the devastating impact of this of this crisis. And so, when we started talking about it, we were thinking, you know, what could we do that would be impactful, that would be able to be sort of just in time relief and support and assistance for small businesses? And what could we present that would be as practical as we could possibly make it? We understood that people wouldn't be able to attend courses and long programs, um, that the support would have to be, you know, just at the sort of targeted at the right kind of issues that entrepreneurs would be struggling with at this point. Um, and we also wanted to make sure that as much as we would like to engage an audience in sort of a live format, we wanted to make the content available beyond the series so that you know there would be some longevity and that there, there would be some sustainability in this intervention so that you know entrepreneurs beyond today um, would be able to go back to you know the very first session and consume that content at a time when it would be important for them and so all of those considerations really played into this when we thought about crisis obviously you know for us there's an old adage around um, you know the chinese symbol for crisis which comprises those two elements the one element is danger and then there is certainly a lot of danger we can see that in the way that the economy is responding to the crisis but you know the other part of that is opportunity and that's really what we wanted to focus on and today being the culmination and the end of the series what we wanted to do was to translate the message of opportunity and hope and the fact that there is so much opportunity in the face of a crisis that is potentially devastating for so many of us um, the entrepreneurs that we have on the panel today have shown that there's opportunity, have shown that they've been able to pivot, you know, through this change um, to not just survive, but like I said earlier, to thrive. And so what we really want to do in this last session is to extract some of those key lessons and insights, to share that with our panel, um, to share that amongst the, the listeners and the viewers who are tuned in today, um, but also to see what we can learn from each other through this process. Um, so that, you know, ultimately we don't just survive, but all of us can thrive. And so that I think is, is really the intention for today. And thank you so much for holding this conversation. No, thank you, Miranda. I think it's, it's critical things because I think what we often, it's easy to go into negativity. And what we're seeing out here and from the panel and, and many other stories as well, is a huge wave of optimism, which I, I really enjoy because I think it gives us a lot of hope to say, hey, we can do this, right? I mean, you know, if, if I think about, you know, Santo and Ryan and Andres and Fizile as well, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing what you've done. And this serves as a source of inspiration in this whole thing about partnership creation as well. So thank you, Miranda, for that. Um, Ryan, I'm gonna start with you if you don't mind. Um, you know, I think as Ned Florist, uh, you know, what, what change or pivot have you undertaken during this period? You know, sort of start of, let's call it COVID-19, the lockdown, because that hit every business, whether we like it or not, right? Um, and if you don't mind just sharing maybe two or three lessons that you learned up there, Ryan. Sure. 
So, yeah, when April hit, we weren't able to sell flowers and most of our gifts, and we could foresee that because certainly that's not essential product. So we got a certificate at the end of March allowing us to be a food retailer, an essential provider, and we moved into fruit and veg and groceries. So for the month of April, uh, we were really a fruit and veg and grocery business. And, um, and um, it gave us 40% of our revenue for April. So you can't run a business on 40%, but <clears throat> what it did allow us to do is to still continue in some way. But actually, most importantly, what I think the main benefit was it kept myself, and my two partners, and our senior management team active mm. and thinking and trying and doing things. And I, I had so many friends who were kind of at home, business owners in April, who just kind of closed their doors and were waiting out the storm. And um, I mean, they became depressed. They, they, they didn't feel like they had a purpose. <clears throat> and our pivot, besides giving us revenue, really allowed us to feel like we had a purpose and we were playing a role in this crazy pandemic with the assets that we had, which is an online site and warehousing and delivery. And so that was very important for us, super important. And I think the other main lesson we learned during the pivot and actually beyond is for so many years, we've battled to make hard decisions in our business. There've been so many things that we thought we really should do that and we should change things, but you know, we'll think about it in three months time and there are other things to do. It's amazing how a crisis makes hard decisions suddenly so easy. It's, it's so counterintuitive, but um, we've made a, just a one minor thing. We've always had a big call center and we've been reluctant to move to chat because we've always thought our customers want to hear people on the other end of the phone, but it's very expensive, that form of customer service. And of course, we couldn't bring our call center agents in in April, um, obviously. So we moved everything to chat. And it's taken us years to make that decision. And then suddenly it was just an obvious decision, easy decision, and we just made it. And we've had many of those examples over the last few months. Ryan, thank you. Um, you know, I'm just making some notes here, I think, as a catalyst. You know, there were those things that we weren't wanting to make changes, and now it's forced us to do that. I think absolutely right. amazing. Right. So I'm just from your side, you know, if you don't mind me asking it, at sort of, you know, at Native Child, because I think your, your story is, is mind-blowing. Can't keep up with demand here. Um, you know, how did you pivot? And, and, and let's be honest, I mean, looking back, it's, it's difficult. You know, when you're in the moment, you're in the moment, right? Yeah. But now we're giving you an opportunity to reflect backward. So what change or pivot did you take? And what are the lessons that you've, you've learned? Um, so for us, I think like most businesses, we were cruising along, sailing along, blue skies, everyone's happy. And then... <laughs> 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 then COVID-19 hits. Um, the first week, I think the first week and a half, um, we were all at home, stationed at home while we are waiting for our um, essential service certificate. Once that came through, um, I still wasn't sure, um, you know, what to do in terms of, do I bring everybody back? There's social distancing. So then we started distributing all the work home. So the admin staff immediately went home, but um, also like the wrapping of soaps and things like that, um, that could be done at home. Um, then got our drivers, they would then drive around in the morning, deliver stuff. Our staff would work from home and then in the evenings he would then, or the next day they would then collect. Um, and it, it was rough at the beginning uh, because it was very difficult to balance what was happening and to realize what was happening. And then, of course, uh, the biggest change for us um, was then we had to, um, I had to employ more people to, for customer service, social media, um, to answer all the inquiries. We went from maybe answering 200 DMs a day to nearly 700 DMs a day. Um, it was, we could not cope. Um, and of course, for a long time, I mean, the business has been online. It started online even before uh, we went into retailers, but we, we did find there was a lot of resistance um, with my specific target market in buying online. And all of a sudden, that just went away. Everyone all of a sudden wanted to buy online. And um, fortunately, about four months before, uh, we had moved on to our own server because when we do our... Um, 
uh, sales and net, our website kept crashing. So it kept crashing and we realized that the space wasn't enough to accommodate a sale. And so we had just moved on to our own server. And fortunately, we, we were then able to cope with all the um, sales that came through. However, it did take forever to process all the sales because hardly anybody's at the office. Um, I don't want the business to be shut down. So we had to constantly talk to our customers, please be patient. Usually people get their deliveries within three days. It was taking up to two weeks. Um, that, that's how much volumes we, we had to go through in terms of processing of orders. Um, so yeah, I would say the immediate thing that we had to do was, okay, calm down, employed an additional two people to handle um, social media inquiries, because then we realized everyone is on their phone. Um, and, and then, of course, we try to still manage the workload from home. It was easy for admin staff, but a bit more challenging uh, with the production side. Got it. Sonja, thank you so much. Um, yeah. you know, I'm just making some notes, but, you know, a critical thing, number one, a catalyst for business that's already online. How did this really, you know, give the ignition? Uh, you know, you've employed people. You know, this is, this is, this, these are the stories that we often don't hear about is employing people. Thank you. So I think as, as uh, and I speak on behalf of many South Africans, thank you, because that's what we need. And, and I think this is why, you know, I say let's support each other because this is the outcome. Employment is, is a big problem that we have, you know, for base, but thank you. So, you know, I say on my behalf specifically, but I'm sure I speak for millions of South Africans as well. It's phenomenal. Uh, I'm going to try and hold back the tears for now because I think what you've done is absolutely amazing. And it gives me, you know, it, 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 gives, it gives me energy as well. Um, Fizile, um, you know, we we're hearing two businesses that start online essentially um, and, and pivot quickly. Yours is slightly different. So Fizile, what change of pivots did you undertake at, at Green Scooter? Um, hi, thanks for having me. Um, I'll start there. Um, so with where... We started as Green Scooter was was supposed to start off in, uh, like a few years ago as a ride sharing platform, but obviously we had many plans. Part of them was manufacturing EVs and selling them into the market. So when 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 COVID hit, actually the first not when COVID hit, I think when the announcements were made, um, one of the first things that I thought of was that a few years ago. Um, I'd already came up with the idea, I think it was back in 2014, I'd already came up with the idea with the idea of Scooter Treats. And Scooter Treats was supposed to be, you know, the next um, e-services platform targeting SMEs. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we found ourselves in the background, I think we're, we're trying to finalize the preparation of uh, documents for the factory so that we can start, uh, you, know, um, you know, rolling out the, the plans that we had. And um, on the announcement, I was like, you know what, um, guys, it makes no sense that we, we we've got a couple of we've got a couple of electric vehicles. We've got some good relationships with with some, with, with some guys down in Cape Town and other places. Let's just take our vehicles and put them into in, into into work, and so that people can actually see the feasibility of electric vehicles within an e-services ecosystem. So that's where it all started. It was, it was, it was knowing, because I've, I've always known this, like the green scooter idea, I came up with it back in 20, you can say 2014, but 2015 is when I actually started jotting down everything. And um, it was just always knowing where the world was going to go, one, two. Um, being, we were sort of kind of prepared for something like this. Because if you look at it from a, from a logistics point of view, when you are running a delivery platform, um, utilizing an internal combustion engine versus an electric vehicle. There's a lot of overheads, there's a lot of net savings on our side from, a, from, a e from an EV versus the internal combustion engine. So we found ways of making our services affordable. So we started off with, with the grocery delivery. We did that in the north. Um, it was something that was working. And um, because I've bootstrapped, <laughs> literally I've bootstrapped my, my, my entire business from start to finish, um, we started off with... Um, uh, you know, using WhatsApp as, as, as a mode of communication. So one thing that I was very passionate about a few, probably 2013, 2012, was how powerful WeChat as a platform actually was. You know, it was, if, if, if WeChat was, was, was really successful in Africa, it would have replaced 
um, a lot of e-services um, apps because, you know, from a merchant point of view, it's easy to transact as, you know, the way they're doing it in, 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 in the Middle East or Asia. So we started off with, 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 your, with your grocery deliveries. We've been doing that through, through WhatsApp. And then I decided that, you know what, creating another platform or another app in the north of Johannesburg is useless because you're just creating another Me Too app. So a lot of Me Too, like Me Too's aren't sustainable. You're going to come in there, you're going to spend so much money trying to get the consumer's attention, and then you're not going to last because, you know, the, the, the multinational corporations, based on what they do, is that they'll pump up their marketing budget and they'll bully you out, 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 out of that, that environment. So we, I basically took my electric vehicles and I put them in, in the township. So I started off with Soweto, and I knew, and I always knew that the township is, an, is, is, is the next best thing. It's... Think about the gold rush back in the day. This is like the township is, 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 is the e-commerce gold rush. And it's something that I've been telling a lot of people over time. And we took it, we partnered up with a few restaurants in the township. And we've actually now just crossed over since the, since the beginning of April, up until today, we've just done over a thousand transactions. And this is just using, this is just uh, using um, three electric vehicles, um, two in the township, Two in Soweto, one in the north of ja one in Randburg, one in Santon, and one in Sakane. And how we did it was that we decided to add a twist to e-services. Anyone can create a, an, an e-services platform, but the, the, the beauty of what we created was understanding what first mile and last mile delivery is. And that's the one thing that South Africa lacks. There's nobody in the market right now that really, really understands how to how to how, how to design. A, a system that can actually save you thousands of rands from an e from an e-services platform from a first mile and last mile. So one thing that I always like mentioning, um, I actually had this conversation a few days ago with some other people, and actually I had a conversation with my mother because I was trying to explain to her what I was doing because she's also like, she knows what I'm doing, but she does like, she's like not really, you know, there. And I told her like, look, to be honest, to in order to master a first mile, last mile delivery, you need to watch Narcos. Literally, if you if if you if you watch if you watch Narcos, and you understand how the drug business works, I'm sorry <laughs> to say it, but when you when you can understand how how you know the, the 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 entire chain of the drug business, you know there's a monopoly and a uh, monopsony, or I forgot what the word is, but monopsony, monopsony or something like that, in the entire in the entire in the, in the entire system. Once you can like understand where the foot soldiers fit in, where the distributor comes in where the long haul guy comes in, where mm -hmm. that's how you then master, the, master the, the, the entire network. So when we did it, we, we, we not only delivered food in the township in Soweto, but we then connected Soweto with the north of Johannesburg. So remember during April and May, there were, there were, there was, it was level five, right? Um, so people weren't allowed to travel, people weren't allowed to buy. So a lot of people found convenience in you sitting in your, in your, in your nice house in Bryanston and you, a craving, let's say, a kota, which is one of the foods that we've literally pushed so much. It's a five, the kota market is actually a five billion rand market. The township economy alone is a hundred billion rand um, economy. This is stuff that you can find, you know, on the Gauteng, I think it's the GGDA, uh, DPA, I think so. Yeah. I think it's, it's on their website, stuff that you can Google and, and check out. And, you know, we started connecting that, 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 that uh, first mile and last mile delivery of food. And, Funny enough, we actually use Yoko as a merchant system. That's where we started. And um, in the background of everything that I'm actually doing, I eventually started, because I don't want to spend money building a, a, paying someone to build a platform, I actually then started coding my own platform, my own iOS platform. Wow. And, and um, with that, like I said, by connecting the user, the user and the, and the, dis and, and the, and the, and the merchant um, through, through, through what we did, um, we, we cut down costs so much because people think that when I use a big buggy and I take, and I take um, a bulk load of, of goods to distribute, you actually spend more money over time because you're not calculating your, your actual operations and maintenance and your fuel costs. And because we're using electric vehicles, our electric vehicles, they cost six cents per kilowatt hour. So to charge our electric vehicle, which gives you 90 kilometers from a single charge, that gives you it costs you five and fifty six cents to operate our vehicle 
on the road, it costs you 32 cents. So already the cost for us to travel 10 kilometer radius, we cover the entire Soweto. So in, there's no other e-services platform that covers Soweto much more than we do. We eventually, our 10 kilometers cost us 380 cents versus an internal combustion engine, which costs them one rand 14 cents per kilometer plus another rand per, 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 per kilometer of fuel. So it was just understanding the, by looking beyond the seams. Perfect. I think, you know, no, like it's, spoken it's, a lot. But no, no, no. I, and, and uh, this is what we want, right? I, I, I'm watching, you know, and I'm looking at Amrish, Amrish's ears I think, right, investment, investment. <laughs> and I think it makes sense because if we go back to, you know, one of our first parts was really, you know, when we, we had uh, Dr. Fehas talking about cost, understand what are those assets and how you use it. And then you've solved a real need, the first and last mile delivery problem that we see in many emerging markets. Uh, and, and if you can solve that, you know, there's a big market that sits there. But again, it's about pulling the pieces together. So I find that absolutely fascinating. And thank you for sharing that, Fizila, because I think it's, it's really good um, to understand that, listen, when we have a downturn, like you said, you started the business in 2014, 2015, right? Is that sometimes we just need one cog of the wheel to fall into place and this becomes a, a, a big business now, hopefully a big business into the future. And like Sonto, I'm playing a lot, lot, lots more people as well. Um, Amrish, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to you now because I think, you know, we've heard what Sonto has done, we've heard what Fizile has done, and we know what Ryan has done as well. And they all seem to have pivoted quite nicely. They used it from a future growth perspective as well, right? So what are your thoughts around the pivoting that have taken place and what have you observed, you know, two to three lessons that you think would be really valuable to share with us? Thank you, Manoj. I think, I think what's important is, um, you know, the, the panelists were obviously in a fortunate position that they were sort of in businesses that kind of allowed themselves to or had created platforms that they could use, right? Uh, let's just spare a thought for so some other small businesses out there who, who couldn't actually do that fully. Um, but, but that being said, uh, I think, you know, Part of what we saw on, on the outset was ultimately, when can your business do it? Um, and if your business is in a position to do it, you know, it, it, at first overall, from what I've seen in every single one of the entrepreneurs and heard them talk, it's a mindset, right? The mindset is absolutely key. And, and I, think, I think this is the theme of your talk today is, guys, let's, let's be positive about it. You know, let's not just, this is affecting everyone. How do we change? And, and I think, and I think that, that, that is a absolutely a principle and a lesson. Uh, you know, everyone's entrepreneurs here. You are going to be taking this risk. So, so now this risk is a bit, it's, it's heightened during COVID. Uh, but, let, you know, entrepreneurs by their very nature don't run for the hills. They look for solutions. And I think each one of those, those panelists actually, you know, they, they did that spot on. So I think that for me is something we see coming through on a recurring theme. In terms of, in terms of specific uh, pivots that we've seen, uh, I'll talk to one or two of our portfolio companies. Um, I think uh, Sweep South, for instance, uh, obviously they had Sweep Stars who are providing a service to, uh, you know, on the domestic cleaning market to, to individual households. That business was obviously had to pivot. Uh, they subsequently launched into a corporate sanitizer, sanitization, for instance, right? Um, but obviously only uh, after once sort of the lockdown was sort of lifted uh, to some extent. Mm. I think the other thing is where uh, what we've also seen is uh, sometimes if you're one of those businesses that couldn't actually pivot at all, You've got to take stock and say, what resources do I have available, right? Like Ryan, Ryan did, he's like, he's got, no one's going to be buying flowers now, but how do I tap into groceries and potentially how do I, how do, how, how do I use my ecosystem that I currently created? Mm -hmm. And other entrepreneurs I saw quite clearly um, said, okay, I have this resource X and one of these via portfolio company retail capital, uh, one of the individuals saw that they're good in design. So they said, okay, what can we do? Okay, let me get a hold of a carpenter and put the two together and create perspex screens that on lockdown happens is pretty much going to be in demand. So individually, it may not make sense, but I've taken stock as an entrepreneur and, and by partnering with someone else, it does make sense. So I think that's another principle I'd like to say, let's be resourceful. Let's, let's understand what, what, what we have available, what we don't have, and then ask yourself, can I partner? Can I reach out? I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, Sonto mentions DMs, you know, if it means you're sending a LinkedIn, say, hey, guys, I think 
you know, we're both going to be crying individually. Maybe let's put our resources together just to get through this period. And it talks to that ecosystem, you, you, you know, you, you talk about building out, right? That's yeah. one. I think overall, um, you know, uh, face mask is a, is a no-brainer. A lot of people pivoted through that. There were one or two factories that closed down that said, okay, potentially I, I envision seeing that there's going to be a sure need for it. Let's keep it local. Let, instead of importing, let's do three ply. Let's design cool mask. And, and that business sort of kicked off. So, so there are many stories. And I think, but overall, I'd like to have summarized for my takeaway from it is, listen, what, what can I do with my resources? Which, you know, it's, it's fascinating sitting here and seeing these entrepreneurs having put it, put it to work. 100%, Amrish, thank you for that. Because I think you also play an important role in the supply chain, if I call it that, because we've heard stories about supply chain here, right? Uh, yeah. And, and you, you, you've, you've got to, you know, be able to say, listen, this is something we will look at investing in. And I think, you know, some of the good investments that you guys have made as part of the portfolio is really showing because you're looking at what are the needs that, you know, individuals are going to need, whether yeah. it's a good time or a bad time, which I think is really important. Um, you know, I'm looking at Miranda here because uh, even though I started off with Miranda, Miranda, I think, you know, you've been with us over this last nine weeks, you know, all the time. What are two, three things that have stood out for you specifically before I go back to the panel and ask for another set of questions? I think, and I just made a note in the in the discussions uh, panel, and it was something that, that stood out for me right at the beginning. Um, I think it was, Amrish was just saying, what can I do with my with my resources? And one thing that stood out for me was pivoting to your strengths. You know, looking around you and seeing what's possible with what you have, um, as opposed to, you know, going to a position of being down in the dumps and sort of not um, seeing what's beyond your immediate situation. I think that's quite important. The other issue for me was around resilience and that often, you know, entrepreneurs by their nature have to be resourceful. Um, but I think that what, what distinguishes true entrepreneurs is the ability to be resilient to take on you know, these big changes and the crisis that is engulfing us um, and find within yourself the strength to be able to bounce back and, and you know, attack tomorrow and a new market. So I think that's a key issue. Um, and then I think it's about you know, leveraging your ecosystem and whether your ecosystem is your group of friends or partners, customers, um, that's quite important. One of our, of our speakers just sort of in the beginning was saying, you know, listen to your customer. What is it that your customer needs? And I think therein lies the nugget for a lot of us is what does our customer need? Um, I have to say that as the EDA even, we've had to pivot during this time. You know, we've, we've done stuff that we've never done before. Mm -hmm. This series is an example of something that we've never done. And it really was about identifying an opportunity finding the right partner and leveraging our ecosystem. And so, you know, if we can do it, I think, you know, there are lots of entrepreneurs out there who can do that too. Yeah. Thanks, Miranda. I think it's so important, you know, if I think as, you, as you're talking, my personal experience, I've never lectured to a computer screen as much as I have over the last few weeks, which is really interesting as well, but it also says we're democratizing a lot of what we do, which I think is really important. So I'm gonna to come to you. Um, Skills or lessons that you've learned or unearthed for surviving and in your case specifically growing as well, um, you know, what or which of these are going to be critical moving forward is a core competence for your business specifically. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm holding fingers and I hope I'm rich and everyone else is listening. You know, how do we take Native Child Global? Because that's your next frontier, right? <laughs> uh, and then make sure, Fizile, you can help us with String that together from a first mile, last mile delivery perspective. Ryan, please don't forget we need your expertise as well. Uh, and how do we pull this? Let's, let's think of us as an ecosystem that is resourceful here. But Sonja, you know, just, you know, what are the uh, skills or lessons that you've unearthed uh, in surviving and growing? And which of these are critical for you to move forward as a core competence? So for, 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 for me, definitely planning ahead. Um, I think had we not had reserves to, to at least fulfill 80% of the orders that came through, the ship would have sank. Um, but even then we found ourselves right at the end going, please, <laughs> you know, um, because we are in the production business, we rely 
on raw materials. Only a small amount of raw materials come um, from South Africa. The balance come from outside and the borders were closed. So mm. that was the biggest issue that we had. Um, and even now acquiring raw materials has been an issue on certain raw materials. So we've had to then, um, I would say pivoting, we, we had to then find the alternative that will still give the same benefit. Um, uh, I'm talking about things like creams and that, that have a uh, full range of uh, stuff, you know? Um, so, so for me, I think it would be plan, plan, plan in advance. So immediately when the borders kind of closed, I took all the rolls that I used from all my suppliers. I said, well, how much do you have? I'll take it. How much? You and I'm glad I did that right at the beginning because then we, as, as things, you know, progressed, then they would send an email. Sorry, guys, we don't have any closures. All the sprays have gone to sanitizers. And we have a product that uses a spray. And luckily I had, you know, we had reserves. And right at the end, I think we were out of stock for three weeks, but at least the, 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 the stock that we had kind of pushed us um, to, to last us as long as it did. Um, so for me, I think that would be the biggest thing. And um, we were already digital. The, the company kind of like the core focus of our advertising has been digital, has been through so, um, Instagram, Facebook, Google. Um, but I, 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 we're now at a place where it's most likely probably the only most viable option um, in, in terms of making your, your brand or known out there is that digital is here. Whoever was kind of doubting that uh, for a while, we, there's no going back. <laughs> um, so it's just to maybe uh, fine tune whatever efforts that we were doing digitally to make sure that we optimize, um, you know, the growth of the company. Perfect. Uh, Fizile, just on that point, I mean, what are some of the lessons that you've unearthed during this process? And then I'm going to go to the Q&A that we have. So please do, for those that are in the audience, I want to really draw you into this conversation here is to please continue putting some questions into the chat and I'll position them to the panel. So Fazile, just from your side? So on my side, like um, I, I'm no programmer, so I literally had to learn how to build an app. So I've actually, I've actually, mm. I've actually built an app now. Um, it's an iOS based app and we're planning to launch it. So those are one of, one of the key things I have to learn because you know, understanding e-commerce understanding what a, what a virtual marketplace is, what it means, how you can make your money, how you can cut down a lot of money. There's, those are a lot of things that I knew that I would have to do at some point. And I wouldn't say I was, innovation, I was innovative in the process. COVID coerced it. And I think any CEO can actually agree that, you know, they, not one CEO has been innovative during this process. They just had to, take what they were what they were being given so you know that's that's one thing and another was um learning to manage to manage people better you know our different drivers you know we've managed to to hire to hire people and actually you know you have you you, you as much as you're like ahead of the curve you have to um pass 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 down so much so much information and knowledge because you want to make sure that all of your customers that you're that you're catering to on a daily basis um number one they're understanding Number two, um, you know, they get what they've paid for. Um, yeah, I think, I think for us, it was basically that, you know, just adapting. Uh, you know, I'm a strategic corporate communication uh, graduate, and I've always had to learn adapt or die. So having been ahead, knowing what the future would be like, I didn't know what happened so soon, though. So it's been fun. It's been fun. It's been fun. It's been a beautiful uh, struggle. Brilliant. You know, Fizile, what, what that really resonates with me is that you've learned a new skill, which is the coding skill, which, which we believe is an important ingredient for anyone's personal competitiveness, you know, moving forward. Thanks for sharing that. Ryan, um, I've got a question here from Luntu for you. What difficulties uh, did you face in navigating the grocery side? 
you know, she, uh, he or she says that I understand that the online infrastructure was there, but competing with existing grocery services, Brian? Yeah, I mean, we, we encountered many. And, <laughs> um, um, and competi competition actually wasn't the biggest issue because there was so much demand that we were just trying to get our little slice. Um, but I actually, uh, I wanted to, to echo what Amrish said earlier, which is, you know, we pivoted and we had these assets and we could pivot. And um, I, I really feel terrible for businesses that were not able to pivot and aren't able to pivot. In other words, I've got a friend of mine who owns a travel business. He just cannot pivot. He's trying to work out every which way. So I think it's important that entrepreneurs don't feel a sense of failure if they aren't one of those companies that have been able to pivot because it's been, it's been near impossible for some businesses. COVID, I mean, <clears throat> Facile says that it's forced us to be innovative, but for some businesses, there was just no way to do that. And I think we all have to acknowledge that. We're very fortunate. We had this e-commerce thing that became very useful in COVID. And the other thing I just wanted to say was that whilst we all think about the future, um, I think we all have to think very hard about what the future looks like after COVID because although it's a common thing, there's no going back. For sure, it's like a pendulum, right? And I think e-commerce was sitting over here and we've swung, but it's not going to stay there. It's going gonna, it's gonna to move somewhere in the middle. In other words, whatever your business was, I don't think you should throw it away. I don't think you should, anybody should say, well, this is where everything's now moved and where we were doing in the past, that was for the past. I think you've got to be, think very carefully about what your core business was <clears throat> and make sure that that's ready for post-COVID as well as taking advantage of, of the new post-COVID, whatever that will be, wherever that pendulum uh, centers. And we're struggling with that in our own business is to try and think strategically about what things are going to look like. I mean, you know, there are people who are saying, well, nobody's ever going to go into a shop again. Now e-commerce is so easy. Well, that's not true. That's not going to be true. People are certainly going to go back into shops. Um, but hopefully, there are more people who've um, experienced e-commerce and more people are going to be comfortable with it. So we're not going to be where we were. But the question is, where are we going to be? So I, I just, we're thinking a lot about, don't throw away what we had. What we had was valuable as well for customers. We've got... We, we've got to mix and match and thinking strategically at the moment has to be the hardest time ever to yeah. undergo a strategic debate. Just nobody knows what it's going to look like, but the old order is not just going to disappear. It's going to be a mix and a match. And we all have to keep that in mind. I think. Thanks Ryan. You know, it's, it's keeping true to what your core competence of your organization is. What does that uncertain future look like? You know, and that that's, we we can deal with what, have you? Thanks for that. Amrish, um, you know, I've got a question here for you, also from Lintu, who was asking, did you find any of your portfolio companies falling away and shutting doors or having to have conversations of disinvesting in companies? So, obviously, um, we, we have had a couple that have battled, uh, but, you know, and I think without going into the detail, uh, you've had previous series where we spoke about how do we now go, it becomes a working capital cash flow management sort of business. How do we go and streamline this business and, and how do we get a runway? To keep it, for instance, uh, Ryan's, uh, Ryan mentions his friends got a travel uh, tourism business, for instance. Can he keep the doors and stretch it out as long as possible? And at some stage, I think that's where we are at the moment. But how long is a piece of string? You know? yeah. And in terms of that, and I think just to recap, um, you know, one of the things we did then in terms of cash preservation, because I think it's still relevant, and I'll just repeat quite quickly, is how much cash do I have in the bank, right? And ultimately, when you look at how much cash you got in the bank, to the extent you got any loans, have you sat with your bank managers and, 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 and discussed this? And because remember, this is a, it's an engagement, right? And, and entrepreneurs need to sort of continue having those engagements uh, uh, with all stakeholders because everyone is taking pain. And similarly with your landlord, um, uh, you know, and, 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 and so ultimately there you're saying is, listen, can I pay you maybe 50% now? And, and what can you afford? Just have those open discussions. Suppliers, you tell, you know, because everyone's taking pain. So it goes back to your point of, hey, let's take this pain together. This is the best I can do. To the extent that unfortunately, and then you come to your employees where, you know, ultimately you say, listen, let's all, let's all take haircuts in our salaries, mm -hmm. for instance. And then let's all take this and from, from across the board, from, you know, from X code all the way down uh, and potentially then say, well, 
now we've done all of this. So you, 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 you know, you're on, you're on lifeline. And, and, I, and, and you know, fortunately, we, we've been fine where we had some ability of pivoting. But, you know, who knows in a couple of months, you know, if this lasts another three, six months, perhaps maybe, maybe we'll see a bit more pain coming through in that regard. Sure, thanks. I think, um, you know, it's, it's always a mission. Also, I think, you know, while I'd love, you know, and I think many of us are taking the half glass full approach of this year, being extremely positive, you know, I think there's also some of being realistic about it as well, yeah. which I think all of, you know, everyone on the panel has also been able to, to juggle. Yeah. Sonzo, I've got a question for you from Rina, who says, with a near shortage of raw materials, could you have introduced the substitute product? Or did that ever cross your mind, maybe? <laughs> A substitute, I, we were just trying to survive. <laughs> <laughs> because you're not introducing anything new means production testing, all of that stuff. Yep. COVID-19 was not the time to be doing any of that. <laughs> um, so we were just trying to make sure that we keep our current customer base happy. And then obviously then supplying the huge amount of interest that came in and making sure that they, because they were kind of already familiar. Most people kind of knew what they sort of wanted. Um, so yeah, no, it wasn't really an option to introduce anything new other than hand sanitizers. Brilliant. Fizile, there's a question for you, which I think is, 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 is really important because I think what you're going to do is flood the market with uh, app building skills now, which I'll be very grateful for from a, from a, from a country perspective. Uh, Alex wants to know, how did you learn how to, uh, to build an app? <laughs> uh, where, what uh, were the resources? <laughs> well, I've, I've only used Xcode, um, understanding which parts of the source code were, were needed from a date, data services perspective, um, uh, payment gateways. But like, because I focused on building the iOS app first, you know, I, I primarily used Xcode. There's a number of tutorials. I relied on, on YouTube a lot, um, just to understand how to fulfill certain, certain um, objectives within the building of the entire app. Also GitHub. So GitHub is actually a great, a great, a great uh, platform to use to download repositories that you will be using within your app uh, that you're building. So that's, that's just how you can, how you can do it. Well, thank you, Fizila. I think um, yeah, just telling us the, the resources that exist, we've just got to be able to use it, which I think is is really important. You know, um, you know we've got a we've got a comment here from Roy, and and I really I think this is something I want to just pause on because I think it's really important. We've been having this conversation sort of for the last fifty five minutes at least, and to me it sounds like it's gone very quickly. Um, but I you know just a real a word of appreciation from Roy, and I think from all of us here. You know, for, for really to you guys on the panel for stepping away from your businesses for the last hour, let's call it that, and, and sharing some insights, you know, an hour of your time for me is really appreciated um, to everyone on this panel, to everyone that's tuned in as well. It's truly, truly appreciated because never mind, you know, it's over and above the, the ability to inspire future entrepreneurs as well. But to that point, you know, um, Normally we have the session for an hour, 30 minutes or so. I, you know, there is some questions that are popping up, but I also got to be cognizant and respect that you're building businesses, employing people, and being able to start thinking strategically right now. And I want to say thank you to all the panelists who really, really, for me, have given me an inspiration now to continue. You know, we're all involved in small businesses to some extent, bigger than the others, but really thank you so much for that. Um, I'll go around shortly, you know, in, in terms of just final thoughts from, from the entire panel. Um, but I just want to remind everyone and everyone that's attended here specifically, is that even though some of the questions you know, may have not been answered or asked, please do send them to smmehelp at gibbs.co.za and we will send them off to the panel members as well. So if I start, Miranda, let me end with you, Miranda, if you don't mind. Let me start with Fizila. Fizila, any last thoughts around this here? Um, I think that one of the key takeaways um, for, for anyone from a startup perspective or an established um, organization is um, bartering skills. Bartering skills and bartering cognitive diversity is one of the, the key things that I've, I've come to learn to make, to make, to make, to make um, um, surviving COVID-19 bearable. 
like I said, it's a, it's been a be- beautiful struggle. And one of the key things I've had to learn was bartering, bartering skills so that you don't have to, you know, strain yourself because um, there's no mo- there, there's no money to pay people. I don't know if that makes sense, but you know, there's just a way of of connecting everyone together. And then two, it's also knowing that the township has money. The township has money and it needs you to use an inside out approach and not an outside in. You yeah. need to understand the market that you're tapping into. You need to, you, it, it helps a lot when you're from there because then you can, because as much as you're a producer, you're also a consumer. And I think the last bit is, look, if, if you want to prepare yourself for the next five years, um, if you're a retailer or a, 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 a logistics delivery company, um, electric mobility is going to be the future that will save you thousands of rands. And, you know, we are definitely doing that. We are definitely leading it. And there's a lot of things that we'll be doing that a lot of people will be buying all types of electric vehicles from us. But thanks Fizile, for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Fizile. Sonto, any final words from your side? Um, I think for me, uh, for businesses, anyone wanting to get into any business, actually, it's not even my type of business, don't overlook the importance of relationships. Um, every, every, every aspect of a business has to do with relationships. Had we not, whether it's your suppliers, whether it's your customers, um, whether it's your own internal staff, um, it's important not to overlook that part um, because without that, we, we have nothing. Um, for me, I, I've really had to get out of my shell um, when it comes to building relationships, you know, I tend to be shy, you know, when it comes to, to that, but I've had to really go out of my way to make sure that I build those relationships. Had I not had those, um, I know that I would not have been first on the list when I said to my suppliers, please give me stock. They would have saved it for their own people. Mm-hmm. Um, or, you, you know, and even with my own staff, um, learning to to speak to them and, you know, treat them in a certain manner to make sure that they are on team native child. Um, and, and of course, people, other people outside the business that we work with, like our influencers and all of that, uh, build personal relationships with all of those people. So I would say, um, don't overlook that when you're trying to, to build a business. And then of course, just to upskill yourself. We heard from Fezile, he learned a new skill. I too had to learn a new skill, the website. I learned to build myself. I didn't know how to build a website because when I started, um, I didn't have the funds. So therefore, again, research how to do things, then started doing it myself. So even social media marketing there, I also taught, self-taught. Um, so just upskill yourself, you know, spend an hour a day just learning something, um, set a goal and learn something towards um, a bigger goal of what it is that you want to achieve. Um, the, the, those are the two, I think, major things that I would leave um, anybody watching with um, is to say, number one, don't overlook relationships, work on them. And number two, upskill yourself. Perfect. Briefly, Amrish, your side. So I think I just want to bring it all together because I've heard a common theme again and I've seen this, right? I think in terms of skills, as I said, we're all entrepreneurs. We are in a situation of where we are at the moment. One, innovate. Innovate and be adaptable. So to the extent the textbook example is Kodak, Kodak obviously had a normal environment, refused to wanting to go sort of uh, go move away from film and, and you know what happened there. Uh, and, and similarly, we now forced to sort of the macroeconomic environment has changed. So we have to adapt to that, right? So we got to do it. Once we realize what we have, what's happened is we've got a plan. And it was mentioned by one of the panelists as well. Have a plan in place. As much as it seems, you, you know, that you're out of your comfort zone, it's all mayhem. But we still plan. But plan quickly. And I think the further, the last thing is it then comes down to implementation. We have a plan. We're now building face marks. Now let's do and in all doing and all of this, you have to be decisive. And I think Ryan mentioned it spot on, is that he had to act. What took would have taken months and deliberating and thinking and what are all 
Now you have to act quick. He's got to make a call and it's worked out. And it's okay to make that call and, and not work out, but then try to do it in sizes that are manageable and then sort of change again yeah. until, and that's what startups are about in early stage businesses. We're testing markets. It's about getting that traction. It's about being, but let's just do that now because we all don't know what's going to work. So, and let's not be scared to do that. Do it in sizes that wouldn't kill the business overnight. But as soon as you get the traction, sort of roll that out. So I think, Again, just to summarize that, I think let's innovate, let's plan quickly, let's implement and be decisive. I think that I'd just like to sort of leave that. Thank you, Amrish. It's all about let's do it. Ryan, any final thoughts from your side? No, I keep echoing what Amrish says, but um, I, I think there's no such thing as stupid anymore in business. Mm. Uh, in the old days, you try something, it didn't work, you'd feel embarrassed with your friends, your family, your business colleagues. Nobody's going to feel embarrassed about anything at the moment. You can try whatever you want. If it fails, everybody's going to say, well tried. So uh, really on the positive side, it kind of frees all of us up to be a bit stupid. It really does. It's just, you know, that, that, that word is absolutely fine now. Everybody's going to try things, fail, succeed, and everybody's going to say, you had to do what you had to do to get through COVID. So it can be quite a freeing experience, actually, in all the chaos. Ryan, that's absolutely powerful. You know, we, we're free. We don't have the shackles on us any longer. I think mentally, it's, it's, a, it's a big thing that pops up. Thanks for that, Ryan. Miranda, last few thoughts from your side. I just want to echo what Ryan was saying, because that's really what I was thinking, you know, to, to keep what works, um, to discard what doesn't work and what doesn't serve you anymore, and have the courage to try something different. And then, of course, if you fail, to fail fast and to fail forward, and hopefully to learn in the process. So. Perfect. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you so much. To our audience out there, I have not forgotten that we had a prize to go with the book here for the most interesting comment that we got over the series. Uh, I was planning to, 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 to choose the winner today, and I thought to myself, that doesn't make sense. We've still got a session today. Let's include the individuals here. And what we'll do for everyone who's joined is to please have a look at our LinkedIn page tomorrow and we will have announced the winner on our LinkedIn page uh, on, on, at, at Gibbs, uh, the Gordon Institute of Business Science. With that, it also reminds me for everyone that's been with us for the last 10 weeks, thank you. Please remember that these were recorded sessions and the resources will always be available for everyone to freely be able to see and consume at a later stage as well. I think it would be really important here for us to be able to keep these resources going. And to Miranda and team from the Entrepreneurship Development Academy, I know that you'll be putting up more resources, no pressure into the future as well, but really continuing this because what we've seen is that these little things or these ingredients and these nuggets of gold that keep coming up helps all of our businesses and our economy to a large extent be able to start growing again because small business is the backbone of every economy anywhere in the world. So on behalf of myself, Manaj Chiba, you know, thanks to JP Morgan and the Entrepreneurship Development Academy. I really thank everyone who's joined us over the last 10 weeks. It's really been eye-opening for me specifically to sit on this side here. And I trust that everyone has been able to, to really get this together. Again, last point, if you've got any comments, please, or any questions, please feel free to email smmehelp at gibbs.co.za and we'll try and get them answered for you to the best of our ability. Thank you, everyone, and I hope you've really enjoyed this, and I hope to hear many more success stories. Thank you, everyone.